What's up? My name is Ken Dumbo, the MC with the sauce. Don't forget to subscribe to JKU. The Deputy Secretary to Cabinet in charge of Finance and Economic Development, the Deputy Secretary to Cabinet Administration, the Acting Secretary to Treasury, Chairpersons of Service Commissions, Permanent Secretaries, Heads of Government Agencies, Senior Government Officials, Members of the Press, I notice the head of the delivery unit is not acknowledged. Head, presidential delivery unit, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. I wish to welcome you all to this morning's press briefing. This morning I will address a number of issues pertaining to public service delivery. This arises from the press conference on matters of national interest that was held by the President of the Republic of Zambia, Mr. Kainde Chilema at State House on Wednesday, 5th June 2024. During the press conference, the President addressed matters of national interest pertaining to national unity, rule of law, the fight against corruption, drought, and rebuilding the economy. During the address, the President raised concerns on a number of national issues and called upon the citizens to work together with government to find solutions. Accordingly, a number of directives were issued to the public service aimed at enhancing public service delivery in light of the matters of national interest highlighted. My address this morning is therefore going to focus on the role of the public service in implementing the presidential directives on the various matters affecting the nation. Before I delve into that, allow me first and foremost to thank the Republican President, Mr. Kainde Ichilema, the Honorable Ministers who are members of Cabinet for the clear, focused, and well-visioned approach that the New Dawn government has placed and which we as a country are heading to. We are grateful for the reforms that have been embarked on and we appreciate the progress we have made in delivering services for the 20 million Zambians. We are aware that we've made progress in getting the mines back to production. We've made progress in opening new mines, progress in improving the maize production despite the drought, progress in paying retirees. We've been able to run a credible budget for many years. It's rare that you have consistent, credible budgets. We've managed to do that. We've made progress in the restructuring of the debt. We've made progress in responding to the drought through the response plan. So allow me to also thank all of you here and through you, the rest of the public service workers, for the work done in ensuring this progress that has been made. However, we are also alive to a number of challenges that we'll dwell into, some which the President touched on, but others of generic nature, the effects of the COVID-19, the debt burden that we've carried, the cholera outbreak, and now we have the drought. Ladies and gentlemen, I will start with national unity. During the press conference, the President emphasized the need to maintain and promote national unity. He called upon all the citizens of this country to live in unity regardless of our ethnic 
backgrounds. We, the public service, play a crucial role in promoting national unity. We are an embodiment of inclusivity and diversity in the country. The composition of the public service should mirror the national character at all times. People should be recruited into the public service based on competence other than any other consideration. Public service workers should be willing to be deployed in any part of the country where their services are required, regardless of their place of origin. Accordingly, I expect all the service commissions and permanent secretaries to lead in ensuring that the public service remains an epitome of national unity. Let national unity underline all your recruitments, deployment, and promotion processes. I expect you to enforce the existing human resource policies for the public service in a fair and transparent manner. Permanent secretaries and head of institutions who fail to enforce these policies will receive appropriate sanctions. This is what the people of Zambia expect from us. This is what the president expects from us. And this is what I expect from you. Ladies and gentlemen, rule of law. As a public service, we need to uphold the rule of law for our country to attain its developmental aspirations. Unfortunately, our performance has been below expectation in a number of areas. Some instances of lawlessness observed in our country is abetted by failure on our part as public service workers to enforce existing laws and policies. There are also some public service workers who abrogate the law with impunity for personal gain. Going forward, I expect all public service workers to be law-abiding citizens in our day-to-day -day operations. We also have a duty to collaborate with law enforcement agencies to curb lawlessness in the country. We, as public service workers, develop the bills, make the acts, go on to implement, and also enforce. But somewhere down the line, we have stopped enforcing. We have stopped following the laws that we ourselves make. We are driving cars without number plates driving on the wrong side of the road. The driving cars that are not supposed to be on the road. This must stop. We must ensure that individuals and institutions are held accountable for their actions by reporting wrongdoing to relevant authorities. We must be above board at all times. The misuse of government vehicles, abuse of fuel, abuse of maintenance are all issues that must stop. The Permanent Secretary of Transport is directed to withdraw all competence licenses from all government officers except drivers. The 2018 circular is clear as to who should drive a government car and who shouldn't. I expect that to be done immediately, and only drivers should remain with competence certificates. Secondly, I expect government cars to be parked by 18 hours every evening. All government cars will be parked by 18 hours every evening. 
or those who are not entitled to personal to hold their vehicles must immediately stop using vehicles as if they are personal to hold. Secondly, the PS transport is expected to adjust our priorities in terms of the vehicles we are buying. It just takes any one of us to go to any ministry and see the number of 4x4 four four vehicles parked and you ask yourself what they are doing there. That must stop. So I expect PS Transport to review and recommend to Cabinet Office the vehicles to be bought, what capacity and for what responsibility. I don't think all vehicles must be 4x4 four four vehicles. The fight against corruption. Since assuming office in August 2021, the current administration has been unequivocal on its stance on corruption. There is no single citizen or institution in the country that can claim ignorance on the expectations of this government on this matter. Neither can any citizen claim ignorance on the dangers of corruption. <clears throat> corruption is a pervasive, a pervasive vice that undermines the trust and confidence of citizens in their government. It erodes the rule of law distorts public policy decisions, and hinders economic development. In short, the people of Zambia lost confidence in this public service. We are the chosen few, the chosen few to bring back trust into the public service. And we must all count ourselves lucky to be the chosen ones to do this. We have to get back the trust of the Zambian people. The Zambian people must speak proud of us. I therefore prod the public service to ensure that public services are delivered devoid of corrupt practices. Our corruption levels need to continuously go down. This is in line with our national values and principles, as well as the code of ethics for the public service and local government service, which all public service workers are expected to uphold. I am aware that less than 20% of the public service have acknowledged and signed the code of ethics. 20%. In short, one out of every five where you are sitting, you can count. Five of you, only one are signed. The rest have not looked at the Code of Ethics, have not even signed to acknowledge because it's a, dictate, it's a dictate that you must sign. You must acknowledge that you're going to be honest. You're going to be patriotic. You're going to be people of integrity. I urge all permanent secretaries and directors across the public service to work closely with the Anti-Corruption Commission in implementing the recently launched whistleblower policy in your respective ministries and institutions. When we joined the civil service, people would go and report a driver stealing fuel an officer stealing paper, anyone abusing government, we used to go and report. Today we don't do that. The public service sits, watch people do wrong, and look the other side. If we are lucky, you go and complain to the public. Time has come for us to act on any wrong we see in the public service. And that starts with me, my conduct, my attitude, and whether I uphold the code of ethics. If I abuse fuel, my officers will abuse fuel. If I go for fake workshops, my officers 
who go for fake workshops. If I make fake trips, my officers will make fake trips. It starts with me. I encourage all public service workers who witness corrupt practices to report to relevant officers without any fear of retribution. My office will do everything in its power to ensure that whistleblowers are not victimized. This is in accordance with the whistleblower policy and the Anti-Corruption Act No. 3 of 2012. Ladies and gentlemen, the fourth item was discipline. On 30th May 2023, the President drove all the way to Chongwe on our request and launched the revised human resource policies for the public service. The overarching objective for the revised policies is to ensure that the public service has a professional, ethical, disciplined, and committed workforce. Among the revised policies which were launched is a disciplinary code and procedures for handling offenses in the public service. The revised code is instructive and comprehensive, covering a wide range of offenses to curb indiscipline in the public service. You may be interested to know that the code has included offenses such as tribalism, hate speech, playing games on electronic gadgets during working hours, reporting late for work, idling on duty, and a new introduction, active participation in politics. The Code of Ethics for the Public Service has also been revised to provide guidance on expected conduct by all public service workers. You will be receiving an electronic copy of the code, which you will have to sign and return to my office within 30 days. The entire public service must fill these forms and return them within the next 30 days. I direct all permanent secretaries and directors of human resource and administration to strictly enforce the disciplinary code and procedures for handling offenses in the public service. Cabinet, through the Deputy Secretary to Cabinet Administration, will receive monthly reports of disciplinary action in every institution, and permanent secretaries will be held accountable for failure to discipline or just sure not working on disciplinary cases. Now, controlling officers are expected to take sanctions on the directors. Directors are expected to take sanctions on the assistant directors when it goes down. I want to make it very clear that I, on my part, will faithfully, sincerely proceed to enforce the disciplinary code and procedures for handling offenses on all those that I directly supervise. Whether they do their part or not, it's up to you. But I will do exactly that for all those that I supervise. The biggest failure of the implementation of the disciplinary code has been the surrendering of officers. I had directed a few months ago <clears throat> that we stop surrendering officers and we take appropriate disciplinary action. If an officer, if you decide an officer can't be in your ministry, why should 
the officer not be in your ministry? Does he come home late? Does he come for work late? Is he a drunkard? Is he a political cadre? What is it? What's the reason why you're surrendering? Or is it pure hate? What is it? We will not accept chairperson's commission, permanent secretaries, no more surrendering of staff. Every officer must be actioned on. Every officer must be labeled drunkard, lazy, thief, tribalist, hate speech, label, charge, suspend. Those to be dismissed, we dismiss. We come to drought. The recently experienced drought has adversely affected the agriculture and energy sectors, among others. As public service, we have an obligation to help the country navigate the negative impact of the drought. We need to exercise prudence in the application of public resources by channeling the funds to the critical areas. I therefore expect all public service institutions to adhere, strictly adhere, to the realigned 2024 national budget and cabinet office secular minute number 10 of 2024, as well as any other seculars that may be issued to further provide guidance on the utilization of public resources. The realigned budget is, a, is expected to be tabled in the coming sitting of Parliament. The expectation of government is that the public service plays its part in ensuring that food is distributed to all the 84 districts severely hit by hunger. I wish to commend all public service workers through the DMMU who have contributed towards the distribution of food by the government to affected communities. Special mention here, the provincial teams and the district teams and ultimately the national team. I have confidence that the Ministry of Agriculture, the Food Reserve Agency, the Disaster Management and Mitigation Unit and other government departments will perform to expectation. We have the political will. We have the support from cooperating partners as well as the competence and experience required to deliver the results. I therefore expect you to work together as public service workers and ensure that there is efficiency and accountability in the purchase and distribution of maize across the country. I encourage all public service workers to plant at least one hectare of maize each as your individual contribution towards the national food security. Utilize the available facility under the public service microfinance company to finance your agricultural activities. Ladies and gentlemen, to address the energy crisis, government has zero rated the importation of equipment for, all, for alternative energy sources. I expect all government ministries and institutions to adhere to the presidential directive of ensuring that all government buildings and offices have solar power systems sufficient to support operations in the absence of hydropower. Ministry of Energy, presidential directive was clear. All government offices must go solar. I have noticed that we are moving extremely slow, PS. I mean, the uh, RIEA, Rural Education Authority, have been given this task, but I think we must double up and move very quickly. The initiative for putting solar panels in government buildings, I'm sure all of us will say, but we didn't budget for that SC. Yes, you didn't budget for that. However, I expect that the money for this initiative will come from savings. These will be funds which 
I've been saved from a number of steps. Mainly from the suspension of non-essential local and international travel. In short, we are also stopping unnecessary workshops. We are going to encourage public service workers to work from their offices. When we are being employed, we are employed to work in offices. All of a sudden, the public service believes that you can't concentrate in the office. It ends today. We are going to concentrate in the office. If you are too many to fit in an office, cabinet office has got a beautiful conference room. And next to them, we have Lusaka province. P.S. Lusaka has a, even a bigger conference room. In short, let's go and hold our conferences in government buildings within the district. This issue of only concentrating in Kabwe, only concentrating in Chilanga, in Chongwe, ends today. <laughs> Cabinet Office will not approve any such requests. The amount of money we expect to save from the Acting Accountant General will be adequate for us to put up solar panels on each and every building. For example, business class is now 200 and what, uh, P.S. Simpson? 230. So you can imagine 230,000 will buy solar panels and put them in cabinet office. No business class travel. I, I wish to appeal to the public service workers to adopt alternative sources of clean energy in our homes and cooking and for cooking and lighting, among other uses. I expect all permanent secretaries and directors to lead by example. For cabinet, the ministers are leading by example. They are all shifting to solar and releasing the energy we have for the productive investments sectors. We too can make that difference. The PSP, the public service microfinance company, is able to finance solar panels, batteries and everything. Please get in touch with them. I expect all permanent sectors and directors to lead by example. We must reduce our reliance on charcoal as well, which excavates climate change. Before we ban the burning of charcoal, I am directing the Permanent Secretary's Energy and Green Economy and Environment to provide immediate alternatives to charcoal. Thereafter, we can then push the law enforcement agencies to enforce existing regulations and bylaws around charcoal burning and trading. We have neighboring countries where they don't burn charcoal, and they're still getting one we can do the same. In terms of alternative sources of clean energy, I have been driving an electric vehicle now for how many months? Yes. Three. Three months. I've been driving an electric car, small electric car. It gets me home. It brings me back to the office. It actually brought me to the conference room today. It's possible. We as government can lead this exercise. I want to thank Cabinet Office and Ministry of Transport, the two who have got electric cars. Is there any other ministry with an electric car? Not even Ministry of Green Economy. <laughs> Next month, Cabinet Office starts putting solar panels. I haven't been to the filling station for three months. I've just been going to charge. However, next month when the solar panels are put up, I'll even stop going to the hydro. I'll now be using solar. And this car, 
For those of you who drive fast, it's actually faster than Toyota Hilux double cup. <laughs> so once the panels are up, I'll be driving solar. I won't go to the filling station. I won't go to Zesco. I'll just go to the sun. We can all do that. And I think we should do it. So with this, I'm directing PS Transport to review the guidelines for procurement of vehicles by prioritizing the purchase of electric cars. One, two, smaller cars. What do you need a 4 by 4 Hilux to deliver mail? Why do we need a Nissan Patrol to deliver mail? All our mail carriers should be on electric motorbikes, electric small little cars to deliver the mail. We will serve a lot in terms of energy. The drought has also increased the demand for boreholes in our communities to provide water for domestic and agricultural use. We have done very badly on this front. I expect boreholes to be drilled in the next 14 days, come what may, in all the affected districts. As public service workers, we should not connive with service providers in the water sector to exploit government. Three years after introducing the price index, boreholes are still missing from the ZPPA price index. Three years. How? Why are they missing? Why don't we have a price index on boreholes? We must ensure that there is value for money in the boreholes constructed using public resources, including funds under the CDF. Further, we must ensure that correct standards and fees related to boreholes drilling are published and disseminated to the public. I've directed PS Water and is aware that in the next quarter bulletin of ZPPA, I expect to see the price index for boreholes and for reticulations. I have also directed the Permanent Secretary Ministry of Water Development and Sanitation to deal decisively with any culpable officers within his ministry. Water is life. We can't fail to, do, to deliver water. However, as I stated at the beginning, if he doesn't move on his stuff, I will intervene. Ladies and gentlemen, rebuilding the economy. Allow me to commend the Secretary to Treasury and his team and the Ministry of Finance and National Planning for the attainment of the debt restructuring feat. I think as public service workers, we should all be proud that we are here at such a time where we are part of the process of moving from default, sorry, moving out of default and going back into a respectable country. So job well done and well done, all of you. However, the work of rebuilding the economy has just started in earnest. This calls for prudence in the use of available resources in all sectors of the economy and creating a conducive environment for economic growth and development. As guided by the President, we need to shift our attention from consumption expenditure to investment expenditure. We must all be committed to reducing wastage, improving transparency, and ensuring that public funds are used for the intended purpose. My office will continue to guide and monitor all government ministries and institutions on these matters of national importance. I therefore expect all ministries and institutions through the ministerial delivery units to focus on the five priority areas to ensure timely service delivery. I encourage you to identify areas 
where you can engage in public-private partnership. This is a viable vehicle for financing development interventions. My emphasis here is that PPP is not an issue for the PPP Council only. It's not an issue for Ministry of Finance only. It's not an issue of Ministry of Justice only. You noticed Ndola Lusaka Road. That's Ministry of Transport. Each ministry here can do something on a PPP. PS Defense. Each ministry here can do something on a PPP and joint ventures. Why? All we've done is restructure the debt. Our balance sheet is still the same. So where do we get the money? It's from the private sector. And in this vein, I want to make a passionate appeal to all of us that we are in these offices to serve the private sector. I know you don't like it, but that's the truth. Who grows an economy? It's a private sector. So why are we leaving private sectors standing one hour at the counter waiting for someone? Five days, you are not in the office, a person must wait. No. We have to change our approach. And our approach is that the private sector, the people who are going to change this economy. And it can only happen if we facilitate. I'm grateful to the PPDF, the PDU, we're doing very well in relating to the public sector. But I would like that to spread across all ministries. I would like ministries to go look at their ministerial delivery units, because in there you find PDU, in there you find PPDF, and let's deal with the private sector and look at what are the things we can do immediately to serve our people. I would like the head uh, PDU to ensure that all controlling officers, head PDU, can you ensure all controlling officers, directors, are trained and reoriented in PPP? It's important. Civil service travel. I know we have uh, suspended travel, unnecessary travel. And please note that the suspension of travel is not only abroad, even local. Permanent secretaries, we have not been controlling the civil servants that are going, the public service workers that are going around the country. I have been monitoring this very closely. We have not done our work. We're just allowing anyone to go anywhere. I've chatted with the provincial PSS. They've been monitoring all of you. Accountant General, watch Ministry of Finance. There are too many people going to the provinces. They're the custodians of money. Don't allow that. Let's stop that. And let's not have people going to the districts to go and make a U-turn and come back. That's a cost to government. Let's start virtual meetings. We cannot go on spending money anyhow. So even local travel will be controlled, cabinet directed, for all controlling officers now. Your local staff to travel, you must UFS your minister. Even if they're going to Kitwe, Kawe, UFS the minister. So that the minister sees the pattern of what's happened. We are given a responsibility, we haven't handled it well. Civil service travel. If there's any travel that will come through for foreign travel in the public service, this should only be procured through the civil service travel agency. I am aware most of you controlling officers are allowing, ministry, allowing quasi government institution under your supervision to go and buy tickets anywhere at inflated prices. Some are even buying economy tickets at the price of business class tickets, just to siphon money out of the institution. You are the controlling officers. You are in charge of those quasi-government institutions. I expect you to direct all of them to civil service travel agency. This is aimed at regulating and harmonizing air travel 
to realize value for money. With immediate effect, any travel, any travel for myself, my two deputies, and any of you, if you are lucky to get a foreign travel, it will be an economy ticket. No business class. Those of you who believe it's your condition of service, yes, it is your condition. You are entitled. I will only approve those on economy, not those in business travel. In, in this vein, I wish to, is the Chief Administrator NPA here? She's not here. I wish to bring out to all of us a letter I received which made my day yesterday. It was a hectic day, but it made my day. The Chief Administrator wrote to us, telling us as Cabinet Office that our DPP and the other officer who are traveling to Morocco do not want business class. Please make arrangements for us on economy. Those are the PSAs we want. Those are the controlling officers we want. We can all do that. But if you can't, I will do it for you. On 8th November 2023, the Civil Service Travel Agency successfully got accreditation from the International Air Transport Association. The benefits of this accreditation are numerous and include the following. One, direct access to over 290 IATA airline members using single sales agency agreements. And two, ability to procure directly and cheaper domestic and international air tickets on all airlines. From November 2023, we have had no middlemen. We have had no people exaggerating that it's a business class ticket when it's an economy. We have saved a reasonable amount of money and we would like all of you. That's why we want all to come through the Civil Service Travel Agency. I urge all controlling officers to support the travel office by ensuring that their travels are planned on a quarterly basis. A ticket bought one year before you travel is very cheap, extremely cheap. But majority of you buy tickets two days before you travel, one day before you travel. The Civil Service Travel Agency would like to have your plans. You know in a year what your plans are. When you intend to travel, you tell them in advance, if, if we approve, you buy in good time. I urge all controlling officers to support the travel office and ensure that the quarterly reports are done. Ladies and gentlemen, government communication. The, to overcome the shocks brought about by the current drought and economic challenges, government is implementing a number of interventions. As a public service, there is need to communicate the progress that government has attained in implementing the interventions. Improved communication is crucial. When we communicate effectively with the public, it helps to build the much needed trust and confidence in the government's ability to serve the needs of the people. Remember, misinformation thrives on lack of information. All government ministries, institutions must provide accurate and timely information on government programs, challenges and achievements. We have made a lot of success that has gone unnoticed by the public due to ineffective communication. I therefore direct all permanent secretaries to ensure that there is effective communication to the public on programs and projects being implemented by government. You must ensure that you have active and up-to-date websites and social media platforms. Ladies and gentlemen, the landscape of public service delivery has not only changed, but has become dynamic. The needs of our people have increased and are now more complex. We need to be responsive of these changes to remain relevant. We must be united, competent, professional of high integrity, and aim to serve this country diligently. Following the President's Council, I emphasize the need for the public service to implement all directives that the President made on Wednesday this week 
and in future. It is our duty as a public service to implement all government policies, programs, and pronouncements made by the head of state. This also applies to various memoranda of understanding signed by the Zambian government with other countries, cooperating partners, and the private sector. In closing, I want to leave you with an important question. Almost 100 days ago, the president declared the drought situation a disaster. What role has your ministry played? What role has your ministry played to mitigate the impact of this disaster? Have you made any cost-saving measures? Have you made any extra efforts to help the needy? We'll be assessing the next six months, and we are in a disaster state until what date, uh, National Coordinator? Is, is our way distributing maize. <laughs> we, we, are, we, are, we are in disaster until September. I would like all of us to remain in a state of disaster until September next year. In short, whatever we do, we must bear in mind that someone in Shangombo who needs a boho. There's someone in Chama who needs food. Instead of writing a letter asking for 400,000 to go to Mika Lodge, to go to Sandy's, maybe that 400 can do a boho in Shangombo. That 400,000 can do a thousand bags of maize in another district. That's our role. That's the heart of a civil servant. That's the heart of a public servant. I am sure our public service will change. It can change Zambia for the better. I thank you, and may God bless you. Thank you very much. You may be seated. P.S. Kawana. I saw. P.S. Kawana, I thought I saw him here. P.S. Kawana. And P.S. Kalunga, uh, we are going to the question and answer session. Uh, you, you come and you'll be inviting the journalists who want to ask questions if there are any. And uh, these questions are not only for the Secretary of the Cabinet, but they are also for the controlling officers, the PSAs who are present here. So listen carefully. If it's a matter pertaining to your, to your ministry, I'm sure they STU may direct it to you, so take note of uh, the person asking the question and the questions that we can give an explanation, including the chairs of the commission. There may be issues to do with the, the, the commission, so just take note and uh, you'll be requested to, to respond. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, SC, for the honor. Now, today's uh, press briefing. It's a day for the media. Media, this is a time that uh, you've been given an opportunity to ask questions on what uh, Secretary of the Cabinet has addressed. Any question, we'll take three questions at a time. Uh, the guidance will be, when you come here, you introduce who you are and which media house you are representing. And would like to allow many media to participate. If you can uh, limit yourselves to one question, so that we allow the media to interact with uh, with government.
Good morning, PS. Good morning, uh, Secretary to the Cabinet. My name is Sandra Mlinga from Sanifem Radio and TV. My question goes to the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of uh, Energy. Um, I remember the President gave a directive for you to review the monthly uh, fuel prices, but up to now we have not seen that. And of course, the Secretary to the Cabinet has touched on the um, issues to do with fuel. So how far with that? Thank you. Any? Yes. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning. My name is uh, Best Jerry from uh, Diamond TV. My question has to do with uh, issues to do with uh, Chakoban. There is a directive from the Secretary to the Treasury that the Ministry of Energy and the Ministry of Green Economy should come up with alternatives to charcoal use. Um, my thought is climate change is not waiting. Climate change does, uh, does not have, uh, uh, let's say, a due date to say up to this point. So how soon are these measures expected to be implemented, and then the alternatives, how soon are we waiting for these alternatives? Are the alternatives also, are we also waiting for the alternatives up to September, because we are already feeling the impact, and it is harsh. Thank you. I would ask my colleague from the media, those who want to ask question, come closer so that we, we are a government that works, we want things to be done in time. Good morning, Secretary to the Cabinet. My name is Kalunga Mwape from Millennium Radio. I, I followed you very closely here where you mentioned to say a number of directives have been given to a number of ministries of which it feels like there has been inertia to follow some of those directives. What are some of the monitoring mechanisms that you've put in place to ensure that later on, if certain time limits are given to the public servants and then they don't follow, nothing happens. What are some of the monitoring mechanism that you've put in place and going forward so that some of these things that you have directed can yield the intended results. Thank you very much. We have three questions. Can we answer them now or we add more questions? Yeah, we can go ahead. From here? Yes, sir. The issue of reviewing monthly fuel procurements, I know PS Energy is here as to what the progress is, but the directive stands that they should review, and reviewing is a process, and I know that they're working on it, but PS Energy, they're in? SC, DSCs, colleagues, thank you so much, uh, SC, for that answer. Indeed, we are in the process of reviewing to go to quarterly pricing. It is a process, SC, and members of the public. As you may know, all the fuel that we have in the country is imported. Therefore, the fundamentals are not squarely in our control. So, Chair, I may comfortably say that, indeed, we are engaging our stakeholders so that in case it is feasible, we shall jump on that uh, directive, uh, Chair. Otherwise, as it, is, as it is now, the stakeholders are engaged. They simply say because the price, uh, Chair, continues to fluctuate almost on each and every day, therefore to come and put a price after three months, Chair, it may be a very big challenge. Otherwise, we are looking into the matter. I thank you. Thank you very much. Just to assure you that the Deputy Secretary of Cabinet uh, Finance and Economic Development monitors the review that is going through there, and my office is informed, and we have kept a tab on it to make sure that um, they move as quickly. It is one of the items under reforms in the energy sector, so we are monitoring it all the time. The second one was on the charcoal banner. Ch Chakoban, how soon 
are they to be implemented? The issue of finding alternatives, uh, PS uh, doubt, give us uh, an update on where we are on alternatives to charcoal. Then after that we can comment. The Secretary to the Cabinet, the Deputy Secretary to the Cabinet Administration, my fellow PSs, and the ladies and gentlemen. Indeed, uh, Chair, there is need to find alternatives to, to charcoal. At the moment, we are working with a, a number of private players, but in terms of the Lusaka City, our biggest partner is the US Aid where we are promoting the use of LPG, liquefied petroleum gas. There are a lot of private players who are selling gas in the filling stations, but most importantly, a number of selling points have been established in compounds near where the majority of the people are living. And also one innovation that has come on board is to sell LPG based on what the person who needs to use it can afford. Even if you have a 5 kg container or 10 kg container, you can go and buy LPG for 100 kwacha or 150 kwacha. We are trying to mimic the same manner in which charcoal is sold. Charcoal is not only sold in 25 or 50 kg bags, you can buy charcoal in a plastic bag. Perhaps what is lacking on our part, what we need to enhance, is the sensitization in communication to the members of public where such selling points are available. Apart from LPG, there are also many players who are selling clean cooking stoves. Basically, these are stoves that are using pellets, and some of them could use twigs. And in this space, again, we have a number of private players that are partnering with us. Players such as Supermoto, they have actually an outlet here in, in Roma. So indeed, these are the efforts that we are currently doing, but like you guided chair, it's our responsibility to try and see if we can embrace many more players in this space. Like the person who asked the question, didn't get climate change will not wait. We're already in a very bad situation and we need to put our hands together and see how best we can come out of this problem. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, P.S. I think it's also important to note that this issue is part of the disaster response plan on the second side of it because we have the response where we are dealing with uh, relief food and other issues. And on the other side, the building resilience, this is one of the areas. We are alive to the fact that we need the trees. We need all the trees if we are going to have rain. So Ministry of Green Economy have been directed to ensure this is done within the window of the disaster response plan. September is not September this year, it's September next year. Oh yes, just a good reminder. The September I mentioned is not September this year, it's September 2025. That is how far this drought program will run. Because if you noticed yesterday, the Ministry of Agriculture gave us the food forecast which is showing that we're going to have a deficit of 1.3 metric tons of maize. That is up to September next year. Now, we have to feed the people, and I have confidence we're going to feed the people. We've done so, so well so far, and I think all of us must work together and do that. On the issue of uh, number of directives, inertia, the monitoring mechanism, First and foremost, Cabinet Office has a permanent monitoring system because our job as Cabinet Office is to feed into Cabinet meetings. The President and the Ministers make the decisions. We convey to ministries and we monitor what action is going on each and every conveyance that the Permanent Secretary PAC sends out. The remarks I have made are a summary of the conveyances that are out there which we have not acted on. In short, 
all the directives I've given, almost every ministry already has a conveyance with a delivery date and a monitoring system. That is the work of PAC at Cabinet Office in terms of monitoring. But in addition to that, we also have the monitoring system going on in the 8th National Development Plan, where these issues are sitting already. All we've done is enhanced most of them due to the drought, but we have them sitting. So every quarter, we are looking at what's moving and what's not moving in each ministry. So my office, all permanent secretaries attend the, the NDCC meetings, and they are able to see who's moving and who's not moving. Then finally, we have performance management, which my deputies handle for each permanent secretary. And there we detail anything that is listed in there. We ask the permanent secretary to tell us if they have delivered or they haven't. So yes, we do have a very effective monitoring mechanism. Is there need to improve? Yes, most of it is manual. And I'm grateful to, PS, uh, to National Coordinator Smart Zambia for the effort that he's doing to make sure that we digitize and automate all this. Because once we do that, our monitoring system will be very good. The CDF uh, people have a very good M&D process already in place in the Ministry of Local Government. And we're able to know where desks have been bought. We're able to tell where desks have not been bought. And uh, again, we're working with Smart Zambia on that. So most grateful. Thank you, Piers. The next phase of questions, the media. Any other question, media? Are we satisfied? Okay, please come forward. And any other who wants to ask, please come forward so that uh, we do not waste time. Please, oh, yeah, yes. Thank you very much, and I've come back. Uh, I wanted to make a follow-up. Uh, you mentioned uh, that a lot of monitoring mechanisms have been put in place, but some certain things have not been done in certain ministries, and that you alluded to when you're here. What action has been taken, and maybe you can take us through some of the people, uh, maybe that have been suspended, and all those things, so that, yeah, we do understand. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. Best Jerry from Diamond TV again. Uh, this one goes to the Youth Permanent Secretary. Uh, what progress has the Ministry made with the Youth Development Fund and the legal framework for the youth? It's been uh, two years since the government gave this assurance. Thank you. I can't see any hand from the media, so that shows that uh, these are the last two questions. Senator to the Cabinet, your media are satisfied. We can respond in the two questions that uh, are before I us. Answer the one for, for this, the follow up for, for disciplinary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for disciplinary matters. I think that we have the chairs of the, the commission here. Unfortunately, Karunga, Mwape, we, we can't talk about Are we okay with the, the feed or we told not to use them? It's okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, we have the chairs of the commission here. Uh, Dr. Bayani is here. May be able to give an indication on the disciplinary matters they are handling so far. Uh, but we can be specific on individuals. Unfortunately, you know even in 
anywhere else that's not permissible, but they can give you a general feel of what is happening. Yes, people are being disciplined for various offenses. So I'll ask uh, the chair maybe to shed more light on what they have handled so far. After that, maybe we can go to the police, we can go to the correctional and local government. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the commission uh, continues to handle a number of disciplinary matters and it releases that information as when it is appropriate. You may recall that we did announce recently, it was in the media, that of the original uh, 11,000 employed health workers, 200 were dismissed. Through a disciplinary process for absenteeism, negligence, all sorts of offenses within the confines of the disciplinary court. So this process is ongoing and we've been sitting and making decisions on similar such matters. That information will be provided because we need to correlate it, um, get the statistics right, and then bring that information to you in an organized manner. That we shall continue to update you. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, the Secretary to Cabinet, the Deputy Secretary to Cabinet. As a correctional service, uh, a commission we want to assure the public that uh, disciplinary matters are being handled, particularly zero tolerance to corruption. That one, I can update you that uh, not if not a long time ago, maybe two, three months ago, we were able to handle those officers who were involved in corruption, and we dismissed two. So that shows that we are not uh, compromising on that, and we shall ensure that uh, all officers adhere to national values and principles and also zero tolerance to corruption. So we just want to assure you that we are handling all matters of discipline professionally without discrimination based on tribe or race or gender, but we are fair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairperson, Secretary of the Cabinet, deputies and OPSs, chairpersons and all colleagues and everybody. In police, the issues of discipline are a continuous process. When cases come, we as a commission look at them for the disciplinary code and where we find necessary we say we separate or dismiss. We work closely with the police command as well as the immigration command. All those found wanting as far as we are concerned are not tolerated. Of course there are issues of appeals and all that, but we look at them and we function in such a manner to ensure that the law is followed but those who have transgressed are dealt with. And it's a continuous process because, you know, cases are happening from time to time. And we shall continue to do that. Thank okay. you. Do we have a representative from the local government? Secretary Cabinet and uh, the deputies, the uh, man secretary, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Let's <laughs> see, thank you very much. Um, 
going by the responsibility that we are being blessed with to now go decentralization, we have just come back from Eastern Province. There is a tool uh, that has been counted between the Commission and the local government ministry, where we have underlined especially performance on CDF. But the bigger problem we have, SC, is a mindset change. As I talk to you, sir, five provinces of the newly recruited officers are now going through training. Our hope is that um, our hope is that uh, all factors being equal, we can start to punch new blood in the system because we have realized that uh, there's so much laissez faire and inertia in taking up uh, government programs. On the matter of discipline, the biggest challenge we have, AC is issues that evolve around revenue collection. As you may be aware that uh, the local authorities collect their own money, they can't necessarily touch the money that comes from central government because it is structured. But for especially our revenue collectors that go to the markets, uh, in town, for those of you that park in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the CBD, there's so much proofage. But then we've put a monitoring tool where when they are caught, before they come to the National Disciplinary uh, Committee, we do a lot of sensitization, SC, because we realize that uh, some of these, our young men and uh, women, and also if you find them in town, you have difficulties to differentiate between a government worker and a Gaponia who's just asking you to park, and after you park, they ask you for something, a coin. If you don't have, then they can be very rude. We are trying, but uh, it is pathetic. The dismissals are just evolving around pure forage. Revenue collectors stealing, and the same method of writing a five quacha there, then this two quacha goes to government. That's the reason, SC, that we realize that we can change the an input there that going forward with this uh, positive burden you've given us of uh, receiving the officers from central government, we are going to achieve. For now, that is what I can say. Thank you. Uh, Permanent Secretary Youth. The Secretary to the Cabinet, the Deputy Secretary to the Cabinet, fellow permanent secretaries, senior government officials, directors, members of the Fourth Estate that are present, thank you to my friend that posed the question. I think the question that you, uh, that you um, asked was government's plans for a national youth development uh, fund. Uh, you, that's what you called it. Government has not, well, the new Dawn government has not promised a National Youth Development Fund, just a correction. What we have is a National Youth Development Strategy, which is, which is an empowerment program that uh, addresses the issues of youth empowerment, youth employment, youth entrepreneurship, ETC. I think that's what you meant to say. I will say this, that because of the devolution, uh, you have your CDF. And in the CDF, there is a component there, which is a 10% that is earmarked for youth empowerment in various constituencies. Part of that fund came from the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Arts. And so our role is that we are working multi-sectorally with local government to sensitize young people to ensure that they access that fund. 
but then we also have empowerment programs within the ministry. The ministry has 23 youth resource centers dotted around the country, and through that we have skills development. From the time that the New Dawn government came into power, our enrollment due to the advent of CDF and many other initiatives has increased from 2,000 to about 7,000 and 13,000. Uh, that was 2022 to 2023. So that's one of our empowerment programs. What we've also done is that we realize that we just don't want to offload young people on the job market where they can start queuing up and looking for jobs. We have what we call the Graduate Kit Empowerment Program. In the Graduate Kit Empowerment Program, we give our youth graduates from youth resource centers uh, welding machines for those that are, are coming from uh, metal fabrication, uh, carpentry tools for those that are doing carpentry, for those that are doing catering, we give them chef, chefing dishes, we give them um, uh, uh, cooking utensils or ETC, so that as they leave, they go and create jobs. So there's also an entrepreneurship and mindset change component in the program. So some of the young people that you see in Kalingalinga making those gates and making those doors are actually some of our graduates from our youth resource centers. We have an ICOF program where we are supporting uh, vulnerable youth uh, in order to access uh, education. Uh, our ministry is facilitating 20% of that scholarship. We recently signed an MOU with Jane University India where we have 500,000 uh, uh, scholarships uh, for young people who will be accessing uh, this education online. We've gone further uh, with uh, the help of the president and my friend, I call him the game changer from Smart Zambia, to digitize and provide satellite um, uh, kits. You call them Starlink kits in all the 23 youth resource centers. And we also have our UNDP uh, our partners who have started to help us to ensure that we have computer labs in almost all of the youth resource centers. So far, we have equipped three of them. We also have what we have, the, 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 the grants to vulnerable young people. I think a lot of people have seen my minister um, uh, uh, traversing different uh, provinces, uh, dishing out um, uh, uh, empowerment funds. That is a very important program, uh, SC, because in the rural areas, there's a lot of challenges. There's a lot of poverty there. And our side is to ensure that we help even the most vulnerable youth in the most vulnerable uh, places. So the, the, graduate, the, 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 the grant uh, program uh, gives young people from about 500 kwacha to 5,000 kwacha. Now these are extremely vulnerable youth. We do it in Lusaka, we do it in every province. Uh, SC, we have given thousands of date from 2022 to date. I'll have to give you the figures, but the numbers are in the thousands. Uh, we also have our uh, transport or multi-sectoral youth empowerment program. In our multi-sectoral youth empowerment program, this is where we give young people uh, 60,000 kwacha maybe to start a barber shop, uh, 50,000 kwacha to start maybe a salon. So far, we've given young people in Eastern Province 300 motorbikes. Uh, Northern Muchinga, we've given another probably 300 motorbikes. We've gone to Southern Province where, where, where we've distributed about 150. By the end of next month, we would have done about another 300 and we'll move to Western and every other province. We have an internship program where we recruited about 1,500 youths that are placed in various um, uh, uh, ministries that are there right now. The, 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 the essence of this internship program is that we don't want young people, most employers, the first thing they look at when a young people graduates from school or college is experience. Now to mitigate the experience factor, because when they come out of these um, uh, learning institutions, they don't have experience. So the essence of the internship program is not like what has been popularized as stipend. A stipend is an incentive. The essence is to ensure SC is that they have the necessary experience so that after one year, they become more employable. Uh, I can go on and on. We have several empowerment programs that we're doing as a ministry, and I, I, I would take up a lot of your time if I got into those. He talked about the legal framework. Um, 20, 2006, that, I think we had a youth policy in 2006. After that, the last youth policy we had was in 2011, 2015. I'm here to announce that we launched the 2024 youth policy, and so now we have a policy in place. Uh, uh, SE, by the uh, 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 
by the decision of cabinet through your leadership and the great leadership of our president, Mr. Hakainde Chilema, uh, sir, it has been agreed that we will repeal and replace the NYDC Act. So now we're coming up, not only do we have a policy and an implementation plan to the policy, we also now are working on the legal framework. Uh, we have already done two benchmarking exercises with Kenya and Uganda, and we're looking at other countries and will soon be um, repealing and replacing the NYDC Act. We also have a functional NYDC, I think the council secretary is here, and we'll be appointing a new board for the NYDC. The minister has given them new offices, new vehicles, and empowered them so that most of the programs that are being implemented by the ministry can be implemented by a functional NYDC. I submit, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I, feel, I feel very nice, but uh, I've seen one PS itching to add to that. PS small. <laughs> she knows why. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, Secretary to Cabinet. Thank you very much. I just also wish to let you know that today we're very early and we've learned it the hard way. All of us were early today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, PS Youth. That was very uh, informative, very good information that you have given to the media. But we are not going to remain as uh, Ministry of Small, as we are called. We are also called Ministry of Tamangas. So what we have done uh, so far from what uh, Ministry of Youth is doing is that we are also sitting with the uh, industrial yards in the country dotted across the provinces, seven provinces, that is, and I'm happy to also mention to you, SC, that we just wrote to our cooperating partners, the Africa Development uh, Bank, to go into phase two because these uh, industrial yards are only in seven uh, provinces, so three to go, which is Muchinga, Central Province, as well as Southern Province. Now, what we are doing in addition to what uh, uh, Ministry of Youth is doing with skill development is that we are housing women and uh, youth in these industrial yards with uh, different skills. And these skills include uh, metal fabrication, stone polishing, uh, milling plants with the SMEs and the cooperatives. And I'm happy also to mention that with the drought that is uh, currently hit the country SC, we also are housing the cooperatives in the uh, northwestern province, as well as uh, Luapula and northern province, where these cooperators are actually growing the cassava, which is uh, uh, a good um, crop that grows even in the uh, drought season. This is just to cushion up on the uh, crops that are uh, uh, drought prone. And also uh, to mention is that these cooperatives and the SMEs who are being housed in the industrial yards are not only going there to do their work, but we are also empowering them through the citizen economic empowerment uh, programs. And I'm also happy to mention, SC, that we have not remained in the fight against uh, drought. Currently, we are giving out uh, loans through the CEC to the SMEs and the cooperatives with irrigation systems as well as uh, solar energy. And also, SC, I must mention that uh, just last month, we did an advert to all cooperatives and SMEs that are into agriculture to take up uh, the call for applications for SMEs and the cooperatives to apply for irrigation systems as well as uh, solar energy and the total uh, shortlisted uh, uh, cooperatives and uh, SMEs SC, the budget is about 10 million kwacha, and we have shortlisted 1,600 plus applications, and we are currently going around uh, the provinces. Each province has to receive part of this 10 million. We know it's not enough, but it's just something that we can do with what we have, and we are currently going around the provinces just to go and do the due diligence because we don't want to give money to the SMEs and cooperatives that do not even own an acre. And we have to ensure that even when we are giving, we are giving it to the right people that are going to utilize the money and also add to the uh, food basket. 
I think I will end here. I submit. Thank you. Thank you very much, P.S. Karunga. And uh, thank you very much for the PSs who came in to respond. It's really a new dawn. I, I feel proud to stand here. Um, it's a new way of doing things. I'm sure in the past, as the Office of the Secretary of the Cabinet, he hasn't come out to address a press, a live one, but expect more of this to come so that the people get informed. So, but it shouldn't end there. The President did his part. The Secretary of the Cabinet has come to amplify on the aspect of implementation. But the PSAs and the controlling officer also, you have to do your own in your own ministry with the staff. The same message, of course, you have access to it. It will, it will be given to you. It has to go to each and every officer. I know some are tuning, some are waking. They may not be live with us, but they need to get the same message. But also directors. That's why I was asking directors when I came earlier on. It didn't end with the PSs and talking to the top management. I want directors to own this. By the way, directors, you are the owners of the ministry. You are the permanent and pensionable. All these PSs are daily classified employees. <laughs> but don't underestimate your role to moving the economy further. The message was clear from the SC. If you are facilitative to the private sector, this economy will grow. So stop being busy to receive to receive a private sector person. We have to, to do your job most of the time. They come to us and they tell us, the ministry are not available. We have been asking for an appointment for the past two months. For us, they come within a day or two. They have seen us. How come we are able to see all private sector from all sectors? Well, you deal with a particular sector, but you are failing to meet them here. Big bonus now. We are servants of these people. Our salary, to be better, we should be facilitative of them. Our salary, to mean a lot, we should allow them to produce more. And they can only produce more if we attend to their issues. PPDF was set by the president. They call for the meeting. Private sector come in numbers. Government side, PSS, you are here. Most of you, the complaint that you are hardly available. You delegate your directors, director delegate to assistant director, assistant director to a principal office. No effect. They go there. No, we can, I can't comment. No, I have to go and consult. The purpose of that is UPSs to be in that meeting to make decisions. So I've, I've made it a point. I've told PPDF that when you call for your meeting, I want to be invited. So that I provide the response on your behalf. And the consequences is that I'll report to the SC that your PSAs are not there. We are doing their work. Maybe I should get their salary so that my salary becomes better. That's what we'll come to. So thank you very much. And to the media, I was very happy. I can see the value of having the media in the presence and asking questions. Diamond TV, you have seen what your question has done. It has opened up responses. I'm sure you've got more information from youths, small and medium enterprise. I know also community both men there are itching. They would have each to come and say a few things. So there are many things happening, but we'll be coming back again after some time to keep on giving updates on the work and uh, our PSCs have to get used to that. So what remains for me is to thank the Secretary of the Cabinet. Let's see, sir. Thank you very much. The message is clear. We'll do the circular as usual and the matrix to all the PSs so that they, we monitor the question of monitoring. After a thing like this, what our office does is to produce a matrix, which we send to all controlling officers, indicating which institution is doing what. And at some point, they have to give us a feedback. So we get to know who is working and who is not working. And some of the measures which come as disciplinary or or non-promotion of some officers is based on their performance. 
have been there for 15 years. Huh? Probably you have been there just warming the chair, not contributing to anything. That's what ha usually happens. So, ACC, hey, sir, thank you for, for your presence. Chairs of the commissions, thank you for your presence. PSAs, thank you. My directors, thank you for coming. Please send, give this message to your officers in the office. Don't hold it back. It's not a privileged information, even to your fellow directors who are not here. And the media, my appeal is please amplify this. Don't be shy to ask those difficult questions to, to our PSAs. And report to the Office of Secretary of the Cabinet if the PS is dodging to respond or to get back to you. Please report, because they are supposed to respond to you. So that when, when you report to us, we'll compel them to give you the, the response required so that you get to know by that way the public gets to know what is happening. I'll hand it over now to where we started from so that we, we end. PS Justice. Shall we be upstanding for the national anthem? <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel, J Cool, and turn on the notification bell, because I'm going to see you in the next video.